Technology has complicated romantic relationships despite the provided ease of communication. Modern dating weaves technology inextricably across the different stages of love, from casually meeting new people to processing immense grief after a breakup. As technology and social media become more integral to humanity's daily lives, their negative consequences become harder to avoid. Aaron goes to the front door to receive a delivery. While the delivery guy hauls a large box, he recalls the voicemail that his ex-girlfriend left him. She asks if they could just communicate clearly like adults, but she doesn't understand understand why he cuts her off and refuses to speak to her. Knowing she still has some personal belongings at his place, she inquires when she can pick them up. As soon as the paperwork's ready, Aaron unscrews the package which contains a lifelike female doll. After reading the instructions, he sets up the doll beside him while he tinkers with it using his computer. The doll sits perfectly poised with beautiful proportions, blonde hair, and flattering makeup that highlights its attractiveness. Aaron types a command, causing it to say hello, and utters syllabic sounds repeatedly. He pauses and then thinks of something else and when he executes the command, the doll looks at him and says his name. Facing the doll, he also calls it by its name, Nicole. He tests the doll's responses and begins by asking how it's doing. Nicole responds politely, like a human. After a few more questions, Aaron asks if it likes him, to which Nicole responds in the affirmative. Aaron also says he likes Nicole, and it returns the favor by calling him handsome, causing Aaron's emotions to break a little. As programmed, Nicole observes that they're all alone and wonders what he'd like to do. Thus, Aaron decides to make love to Nicole on the couch, all while the doll mutters empty and emotionless praises. While he's doing the deed, the motions create loud thuds on the floor. Aaron groans as he finishes inside the doll, and Nicole thanks him as he collapses over its body. Aaron's relationship with the doll is like how he treats a human companion. He sleeps beside it at night while caressing its hair, and in the morning, he dresses it up and styles it to look nice. When Aaron arrives home that evening, his phone rings, but he promptly declines it and instead walks straight to the closet. After switching the light on, Nicole wakes, follows him to the kitchen, rummages through the fridge and prepares food for him. Meanwhile, Aaron places X's voicemail over his headset. She's grateful for his response and agrees to the arrangement of how she'll get her belongings back. She lists the items she'll retrieve and asks about her red hoodie that she can't seem to find anywhere. When the voicemail ends, Aaron sits tired and frustrated on the couch in the dim living room. He turns the TV on and sifts through the channels while Nicole places his dinner on the table. Nicole sits beside him on the couch as he barely acknowledges her. Later that evening, Aaron is again doing the deed with the doll. However, he appears indifferent and absent, and doesn't seem interested in the act. His phone suddenly rings, and Aaron steps back to answer it. On the other end of the line is Aaron's friend, Mark, asking him why he didn't show up to the party. Aaron makes up an excuse for his absence, but Mark comments that he would have had fun. Nicole, still activated, repeats the emotionless praises, forcing Aaron to hurry outside the room. Mark teases him about it, but he quickly segues to tell Aaron about Chelsea, a girl interested in meeting him. Although Aaron dislikes the idea of meeting new people at the moment, Mark encourages him to start going out and rebounding from his breakup. Aaron insists that he's fine all alone and not being in a relationship. Still insistent on having Aaron go out, Mark invites him to the party on Sunday. When he confirms he'll attend, Mark gets excited because he plans to introduce Aaron to Chelsea there. Aaron hangs up and returns to his room to resume making love to Nicole. When Sunday arrives, Aaron shows up at the party. However, everyone's noise around him and Mark inflating his credentials to make him appear more desirable to the women causes Aaron to get increasingly disinterested. After the party, Chelsea drops Aaron off at his house. He pretends that the night was enjoyable and she tries to lighten the mood by saying Mark can now stop awkwardly trying to introduce them to each other. Chelsea chuckles, but her smile quickly fades when her subtle hints to stay the night gets doused by Aaron's indifference. He thinly disguises his disinterest with the need for him to get up early the next morning. The pair awkwardly fumble with their words until there's nothing left but silence. On impulse, Aaron leans for a hug while the woman expects a kiss. Chelsea holds on to him, but he pulls away and leaves her alone in the car. Disappointed, Chelsea eyes him as he walks away and wonders if she did anything wrong to elicit his disinterest. Inside the house, Aaron opens the closet and activates Nicole. Instead of making love to the doll, Aaron chooses to simply lay his head on its lap and fall asleep with Nicole caressing his head. The morning comes with a knock on the door. Aaron sighs as he comes face to face with his ex. They awkwardly engage in small talk with her complimenting his clean house. Aaron offers coffee, but she declines. So he hands her a box full of her belongings. After she gingerly takes the box and smiles at him, she tries breaking the ice and admits to missing his presence at her birthday celebration. Aaron casually shrugs it off and says he's been busy with work. She takes it in stride and smiles again, saying it's nice to see him. However, Aaron just stares at her, feeling hollow. To avoid awkwardness, he returns the comment. Feeling the palpable tension, she attempts to defuse it by inviting Aaron to the karaoke place on Saturday if he's not busy with work. She adds that she didn't want anyone to miss out on his great share impression. The remark finally makes him smile, but he quickly wipes it away as he does his best to casually consider the invitation. But she's genuinely 
only happy that he's contemplating it. As she's about to leave, the woman remembers her hairdryer, and Aaron curses for forgetting to pack it. While he searches for the hairdryer, she's left standing alone in the middle of the living room. While scanning the area, she finds one more of her belongings and places it in the box. She paces the room awkwardly, unsure what to do, until she walks to the closet. When she opens the door, Nicole automatically greets her, as if she were Aaron. She stands there stunned at her discovery. When Aaron returns, he stops mid-sentence when he realizes that his ex has found Nicole. She stares at him in quiet shock, before looking at the doll once more. Meanwhile, in a dystopian future, there exists a matchmaking institution known as Cupid's Paradise. Here, King Cupid reigns supreme as his minions, little mischievous angels, go around and monitor the residents. Executing King Cupid's commands and policing the people are prison bots. In Cupid's Paradise, people are given visible numerical ratings which appear above their heads. Date assignments are provided, and the match must be made within 100 dates. Those who fail will be trapped in Cupid's Paradise as permanent employees. Throughout the facility, King Cupid delightfully announces that he's found the next match. Broadcasted throughout all the screens is a couple named Mariam and Josh, whose collars simultaneously light up and turn pink. They hug each other as King Cupid thanks them for trusting him with finding their love prospects. Sitting in a club all alone and watching the broadcast is a woman named Chen, rated 7.6. As she gushes over the new match, King Cupid announces he'll send the couple home to reunite with friends and family. Jen stops watching and scans the club. Her eyes land on a buff guy rated 8.5 who's getting a tall drink. As she readies to flirt with him, she's interrupted by a date assignment's notification. Flashing before her is Kevin, a guy who scores 6.3. She's baffled that she's been assigned to someone scoring that low. The bartender asks if she dislikes King Cupid's selections. Above them, the minions watch and gossip about her. Jen claims she's fine with the assignment even though she clearly isn't. Moments later, Kevin arrives, but as he sits down, Jen eyes his score and greets him in a disappointed tone. Kevin offers to buy her a drink, but she lies and says she dislikes drinking. She gazes back at the guy rated 8.5 who's now talking to Elizabeth, a girl rated 7.8. While she excitedly orders tequila shots, he seems disinterested. Jen rolls her eyes at the sign. Kevin asks her questions, but Jen ignores him and instead focuses on the more attractive guy. The handsome man stands and asserts his date. Taking it as her cue, Jen also apologizes to Kevin and lies about not feeling well. When Kevin doesn't get the hint, she bluntly tells him she wants someone who's at least an 8. Suddenly, the club is overrun by prison bots who surround Elizabeth. She shrieks and pleads for one more date, but King Cupid announces that her time has run out. Elizabeth is now a permanent employee and she collapses on the floor as her color glows red. Jen watches with sympathetic pity as the bots take Elizabeth. Elizabeth's date walks away as if nothing happened. After the commotion, Kevin decides to leave and mockingly comments that Jen certainly won't suffer the same fate. With Jen all alone, the bartender comes and notes Kevin's low score. Jen wants to be paired with a 9 or 10, so the older woman slyly offers a way for her to do that, and gives Jen a heart-shaped bottle of white fluid for free. Hopeful, Jen excitedly takes it and hurries out of the club, all while the bartender smirks sinisterly. Outside, Jen hurries to the bulletin board and sees her rating. Then, glancing at the potion in her hands, she smirks before heading to her quarters. In her quarters, the computer suggests clothing options. Jen likes one and tries it on, but her score drops by 0.3. She hurriedly unclothes and spends the time trying on different outfits. An ad for a leopard bodysuit comes on, claiming to give its wearer a confidence boost and a higher hotness score. When Jen puts it on, her score increases to 7.8. Despondent, she watches Mariam and Josh on screen as everyone cheers them on. Sighing, Jen decides to drink the potion the bartender gave her. Although she dislikes the taste, she loves the effect. Her score jumps to 8.2 and she gets a new date assignment with an 8.4 guy named Hunter. Jen giggles, excited that the ploy actually worked. During the date, Hunter waves seductively and asks how she's doing before complimenting her leopard bodysuit. Although it seemed like a polite remark, Hunter takes it further by claiming that Jen could be his little pussycat. When Hunter snarls at her, she gets weirded out and abandons her date. Jen rushes to the bartender and begs for an even higher score. She hands her a lipstick that Jen eagerly takes. When she leaves, the bartender smirks as a Cupid minion laughs beside her. Initially, Jen makes a mess with a dark lipstick, but she manages to salvage it, and her score rises to 8.5. Her new date is an eccentric man who directly asks Jen how many kids she'd like to have. Finding her answers unsatisfactory, he leaves. Jen again rushes to the bartender, but before she can say anything, the lady hands her fake eyelashes which she then struggles to apply. Now at 8.7, she's on a date with Ben, 
but he's preoccupied with what he's watching on the hologram screen. She clears her throat and tries striking up a conversation, but gets ignored. As Jen tries to ask another question, the couple behind her gets matched, which King Cupid announces. Frustrated, she returns to the bartender who hands her a wig. She claims it never fails, and despite her doubt, Jen takes it. When she puts the wig on, her score increases to 8.9. As she stands before her computer, an ad for chest enlargement plays. Jen checks her bosom and uses socks as makeshift paddings. With a bouncier chest, her score rises to 9, and she's assigned a date with Jay, a 9.4. She jumps around cheerfully in her heels and hurries off to her date. She passes by Kevin, still a 6, who's surprised at how much her score has changed. At the club exclusive for people rated at least a 9, Jen has the time of her life, but the people around her look disgusted. She spots Jay and lies next to him, giggling. Like other men, he's disinterested and largely ignores her. Feeling superior with her new score, Jen openly wonders how it must be so boring not being a 9. As she gushes over what those 9 and higher do, Jay notices the sock peeking through her chest. He finally speaks and admits that he knows she's not really a 9. Suddenly, the club quiets down and everyone turns to look at Jen. As she stands and tries to explain, making excuses to not look foolish, her score drops to 8.9. The bots arrive and police her away as Jay remarks she doesn't belong there. As Jen walks away ostracized, the club goers laugh at her. Later, she mopes at the bar, looking ugly and disheveled, her score dropping to 5.9. She claws at her collar while the bartender warns that they can't serve those who are under a 6. Jen finds this unbelievable as she walks out of the bar crying. Outside, she runs into Kevin, who stops her and asks what happened. Kevin glances at her score and asks if she's hungry. When she answers yes, Kevin wraps his jacket around her despite it lowering his own score. While watching the ocean sunset, Jen and Kevin sit silently as she burps. They chuckle and Kevin tries outdoing her, but Jen belches loudly, surprising him. She takes pride in burping loudly as it's her biggest talent. He laughs and wonders what other hidden talents she has that he should know about. Kevin takes her wig and jokes that it added to her mystery. As she rolls her eyes, he puts it on and attempts an impression of Jen acting aloof to tease her. Laughing at how absurd she must have looked, Jen chases him and begs him to stop, all while he's cackling. She removes her boots and chases him until she finally grabs the wig. Around them, the scenery changes to a starry night sky. As Kevin watches her, Jen flings the wig through the holographic scenery. Finally at peace, Jen sits beside Kevin and apologizes for how she acted during their date. However, their tender moment is interrupted when alarms activate, warning about a system breach. Sirens blare as the system identifies the unknown object, Jen's wig, which the system spits out. King Cupid announces that time's up, but before he can specify who will become a permanent employee, his voice drones out and glitches as Jen and Kevin stare at each other. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.